just as there is no denying of the golden era of Islamic civilization, there is also no denying the decline of Islamic sciences. And there were several individual, cultural, financial, and geopolitical factors for that. There were uh, the Crusaders between 1095 to 1289, which were military campaigns uh, by the Latin Roman Catholic Church for restoring Christian access to holy places in and around Jerusalem. There was the barbaric Mongolian invasion of 1258, which destroyed a lot of infrastructure of the Baghdad. Although a lot of science, uh, advancements in science and knowledge continued after the Mongolian invasion, like the Maraga Observatory was built and it produced the best astronomy the world had ever known. The Spanish Inquisition, which happened between 1478 to 1614. The structure of inheritance in Europe was such that the firstborn inherited everything. So what would be the fate of seconders, the second, third and fourth born children? They were left with nothing. An easy way for them to get fame and fortune was to go off to Holy Land to liberate the nation. Until this time, what was happening was that the all major trade routes of the world were going through the Islamic world. As you see, what happened, what was happening was that the more trade you have, we know the more culture and the more business, the more progress you have. The economy is vitalized by trade. All the major trade routes passing through the Islamic world were producing wealth. And there was enough wealth for patrons to support scientific growth. The scientists had the best divine guidance in the Holy Quran and the Sunnah and a flourishing economy to support their work on the other hand. European science at this time, right until the Renaissance science in the 16th century, was deeply influenced by Islamic sciences. After the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 and with the Ottoman Empire, uh, Ottoman army advancing all the way until Central Europe, there were some serious problems for an average European. They wondered where the trade and resources are going to come from and there was a search for alternate routes to re-participate in the trade. What happened in the 16th century had a lot to do with redistribution of wealth and a major shift in the trade routes of the world. Since then, the progress slowed down. It has been progressively declining right until today. There was the discovery um, of um, the new trade route in 1492 with America and the Atlantic trade. And after 1498, with the discovery of alternate route to India. All this... Um, Basically, as we see, all the trade routes were now going throughout the world and very little was going through the Islamic world. No trade meant no money and no advances for the Middle East. Europe, on the other hand, flourished with the new trade routes. This quickly translated into the age of discovery and then colonization. The wealth was redistributed. They, had, they also had excess gold and silver and another addition was the labor in the form of African and Native American labor. This is capital. If you have to buy this, it costs a lot of money, but now it was free. So now you have all this surplus capital in Europe and this excess capital began to realize for the first time that it was generated by dependence on science. And it realized that science can be used now to raise further capital. Earlier science was for the science sake. We wanted to know the truth. But now we wanted science to make money. It was a commercial activity. Instead of patronizing, now science was an investment. It was organized as a business. All four major royal societies happened during this time. Something interesting happened with Galileo, the father of modern science. When he discovered the moons of the Jupiter, he didn't go home and write a research about it. Actually, he had the best evidence against Aristotle's theories. But he didn't do that. He wrote to the king of France and he said, I found new stars in the sky. I'm willing to name them after you if you pay me. When the king refused, the Galileo contacted the Pope. The Pope refused as well, but Galileo found other buyers. He also produced a geometric and military campus, uh, the likes of which there were was a whole history in the Arab world. But then he sued his own student for infringing on the patent of the military compass. That got him the monopoly he wanted. In, in the book by Mario Baglioli, Galileo's instruments of credit offer some marvelous account of how Galileo packaged his discoveries, indulged in complex and often risky strategies to get credit and authority. Thus, modern science was born. It was organized as a commercial activity based on patenting, which is nothing but municipal monopolies. There was a moral issue with monopolies and withholding knowledge, 
and there was an issue of who gets the monopoly and that is where religion collided with science so let us revisit the question what was the problem that the Quraysh had with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was not that the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam preached to believe in one God Allah the problem was that as a result of this belief he asked to be fair in trade practices to give the rights to the orphans to treat the neighbors nicely to free the slaves and to give inheritance rights to women getting rid of the ideals would mean idols would mean that the Quraysh would lose the preferential status they enjoyed in the region as the guardians of the tribal idols all the financial gains that they enjoyed with being protectors of the Kaaba would be taken away that was the core of their confrontation with the religion and this is the core of con confrontation between science and religion now let's look at europe and the authority of church until this time uh, europe was a religious society dominated by the church and church policies were extremely oppressive the church said that the average christian had no business reading the bible for themselves the pope and the hierarchy would be the only ones to read and interpret the bible and this interpretation would not be subject to question the word of pope was considered equivalent to the word of god this agreeing with the pope would mean that you are no longer a believer and you need to be executed the central theme in all catholic traditions was this world is a terrible place it's really a curse human beings have been sent down to earth as a punishment from god and they will find happiness only in heaven so the fact that human beings were miserable in europe was actually expected and europe was being uh, oppressed in this doctrine for a long time what happened in mid 1800s was the revolution which was fueled by the promises of the modern science two movements sprouted as a revolt against the church almost at the same time and it was the bloodiest revolution in the world history one was the protestant reformation which said that everyone must be able to read the bible for themselves but in this new version of christianity also having lots of wealth good education job or resources was an indication that god loved you today if you go to even southern united states in christian sermons you would be told that a nice car and a great job is jesus loving you the wealthiest pre people there are actually the preachers so you would now come to religion to further your materialism modern christianity became a way to justify materialism and to even further materialism the second movement and a more powerful one said that the church has been teaching the doctrine that does not make any scientific sense these people burn the books of philosophy science and anything that disagrees with the church they consider scientific inquiry as equivalent to disbelief the essence of french revolution was a revolt to bring about science logic and philosophy and what happened after the revolution Europe was now a free thinking society free to rediscover what they should believe in and what thoughts and ideas should be at the center of the society it was like an open marketplace of ideas so a lot of science and philosophies came out and what they said was look at what the church has been doing has done through emphasizing god soul and afterlife this life is horrible so the emphasis moved from god to universe we should not they said we should not have focused our energies thought and intellect on god so we are not going to think about god what is the next biggest thing it is the universe and the little that we try to understand the universe it has brought about a lot of benefits it has served us well we've got discovery inventions utilities the emphasis also shifted from soul to body what is the soul has anyone seen it what about all the diseases that are there in the world there is so much to discover also the church the emphasis shifted from the afterlife to this life the church is taught that the life might be horrible here but it will be good enough to life europeans said we are tired of this we need to emphasize the life of this world let us explore political science sociology public relations psychology um, and all other sciences and we'll have a visible impact in europe there was trade there was roads there was invention there was architecture what happened with the colonization of the whole world was as the love of life increased so did the colonization of the world by europe and european colonization spread this thought very quickly throughout the world it went deep into our education system this new thought that uh, took over the world it didn't say you don't have to believe in god it said that you could believe in it if you want to that's your right it's fine just keep it yourself because it doesn't really matter whether you believe it or not 
as science is real. Whether you believe in God or not, medicine is real. Whether you believe in a soul and heaven or not, politics and economics are real. So let us wor worry about the real world. Islamic scholars, on the other hand, got caught up in taqlid. Many scholars felt that the Islamic theology was well defined by previous scholars and all we need to do is follow them. In some cases, people even became averse to thinking because if you think too much, you might arrive at a different conclusion which might be deemed unorthodox. According to Muhammad Abdu and Jamad al-Din al al-Afghani, which were Islamic uh, ideologists and reformers of the late 18th and uh, 19th century, taqlid or blind imitation is what destroys the Muslim, destroyed the Muslims. Many Muslims became just like tape recorders. They memorized a lot of information and reproduced it in various forms. However, that is not an alim or a learned person according to Islam. Islam teaches that knowledge should be based on the highest form of knowledge, that is Quran and the Sunnah, but it is a living, dynamic thing. It must be constantly dealing with creative tensions that arise from intellectual confrontation. And that is the need of today. We need individuals who are willing to rise up to the level of this deen and meet this ta these challenges. Can we even, even imagine what would have happened if the intellectual tradition was not given up by the Muslims and they were still connected to the Quran like previous generation? What would have been the result? Yes, there have been advances in science and technology in the past five centuries, but what amazing level of brilliance could have uh, happened if this, um, they were still connected? Let's look at the current implications of this thought. Most of us born in 1900s have received modern education. And whether we believe or disbelieve in the world, the afterlife, the soul, God, uh, for all practical purposes, our attitudes are no different from what the European Revolution intended. For most of the world today, religion plays a very small role in people's lives. The highest learners who used to be the people of the spiritual leaders like the imams, the religious scholars, the priests and the fathers were now replaced with the PhDs in science or medicine. Religion doesn't dictate how we are going to live our life. It isn't something we take inspiration from to decide where we are going to live or how we are going to raise our children. We already have our priorities laid out in a way that was laid down for us by the colonizing nations. We have taken that deep into ourselves. Spirituality, for example, has been replaced by psychology. So depression, which was um, is now just studied as chemical imbalances in the body. And all you need to do is take pills and more pills and you'll be fine. It comes as no surprise that uh, suicide rates are highest in the modern world because for the problems of the unseen, we have started looking solutions in the scene. And for a Muslim family, the situation is no different because the situation is global, whether a Muslim family is living in the United States, Canada, India, Europe, or even Saudi Arabia. What does an average Muslim family want their children to do? Get a good education. And why do we want a good education? It will give us a good life. If a child says he wants to learn more about Allah, the parents get worried about what job is he going to get? How is he going to get married? How is he going to live his life? Is he throwing his life away? If anyone decides to turn to religion even a little bit, they deal with a lot of nervousness among themselves. Vast majority of Muslims all over the world are barely connected to Islam, barely holding on. Maybe we show up to Friday prayers, maybe to Eid. And what other role does religion play in our life? We might not go to Friday prayers, but when we buy a new house, we do an Amin or a religious ceremony at our house because having bought a new house must be a sign that Allah is happy with me. And the gravest implications. Logic and sound mind is now being equated to atheism. People like Richard Dawkins, who are the prominent critics of religion, their opposition to religion is that religion is a source of conflict and a justification for belief without audience. Dawkins suggests that atheists should be proud and not apologetic. He stresses that atheism is an evidence of a healthy, independent mind. He's even started the out campaign to encourage atheists worldwide to declare their stance publicly and proudly.